Good morning. I am Dennis Schmidt, the pastor of Dubuque Community Church, and I hope you're all having a very blessed Christmas with your family and your friends. It's a wonderful season of the year. You know, there's an old song that says it's the most wonderful time of the year. And it certainly is a wonderful time because it is a joyous celebration of the time when Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, who had lived in heaven for all eternity, left there and came to this physical world that, uh, as a little baby so that he could come and die for the sins of all the people in all the world. And we do have a term for this supernatural event. It's called Christmas. It's Christ Mass. Christ is the anointed of God. He's the chosen Messiah. And Mass is in flesh. It means to come in flesh. And that's what Jesus did. He came in flesh. And that's why the title of today's message is A Child is Born. Uh, the, the slide shows us that in Isaiah 740 years before uh, the actual event said, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You know, whenever a child is born, it is a wonderful event. I never get over the fact what a miracle it is when those little babies are born. But the baby we're going to celebrate today literally changed the course of the whole world. So we're going to focus on those events today. So, you know, when we looked at our first slide there, it might, that might be the Hallmark or the Hollywood type uh, 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 representation of what it looked like, but it was a lot more ordinary than that. God did not come with all the frills and all the excitement, but he came very humbly and quietly, which is what the Lord is like. And you know, after looking at these pictures all, all my life, when I did have the privilege of going to Israel, I was shocked that everything looked so normal and even the dirt just looked like dirt. And uh, I was so used to everything looking so extraordinary in all these pictures. Uh, but we're gonna see today that it, it was a very real event. Even though it was a life-changing event, God came very humbly and quietly. Uh, he didn't come with a lot of fanfare and fireworks and all of those things. And we're going to see today that those facts of those events are even stranger than fiction of, of what, what really happened. Uh, you know, and Isaiah tells us this, often we get surprised when God is so humble and, and, and quiet. But in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, it says, Isaiah said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. God's ways are so much better than any of ours. And uh, so we're going to see that today. And uh, as we're looking at this today, we're going to see that this really was a true life situation that happened, but it wasn't out of random chance. It didn't all of a sudden come out of the blue. God had all the way down to right after the time that uh, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God had been promising a Messiah, a Savior, to come to uh, reconcile his people back to himself all the way down through the Old Testament. So we're going to start today now with part one, Joseph, Mary, and the child. It says that in, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Well, as we read this, just notice again the methodical historical documentation that is going on of this most important event in the history of the world. And so it should be very well documented. And the first part of it says, Caesar Augustus issued a decree. Well, we know a lot about Caesar Augustus. There was a lot of uh, documents from those times. He was a roller, ruler of the Roman Empire, and he reigned from about 27 AD to uh, 27 BC to 14 AD. So that's actually how we know approximately when Jesus Christ was born. No one knows exactly the date when he was born. 
But uh, so he said he issued a decree. Uh, he, made, he set a law out. And by the way, there was no, uh, it was not a democracy under the Romans. They were a, a dictatorship. And so when he issued a decree, that was going to, everyone was going to have to follow it, that a census should be taken of the entire world. Well, a census is a survey of people under the rulership uh, of that government. And the Romans, uh, they just didn't send out a paper and you had to send it back in like we do censuses today. But they wanted a very accurate account. So every person had to show up in their hometown. And by the way, the reason they wanted it so accurate is that they wanted to get taxes from each and every one of these people. So it was the whole entire world, which at that time was a vast empire that stretched all the way from Europe, all the way over to Turkey, and even off over into India. And uh, so it was a vast empire. And then the second verse of it there says, this was the, fir the first census that took place while Quiner Quinarius was governor of Syria. So here we are, Luke, who's a historian and a doctor, is very, he's pinpointing exactly the time when, when, that, uh, when the birth of Jesus happened. So he was trying to be a very accurate historian. So because of all this that's going on, it says, so Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee, to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. Well, you notice again, the, just the complete accuracy of what he's saying here. He didn't say in a, in a country far, far away and all this. No, exactly. He went up to a town in Galilee, to Bethlehem, the town of David. And all these are historically accurate uh, names. And, uh, and the Bible always is. It always will be historically accurate. Well, Nazareth is where Joseph and Mary had made their home. So uh, they're going up from there and uh, they're going up. And, the, you know, the important part of that, too, is it says because he was of the house and line of David. So he had to go up to Bethlehem and Bethlehem actually means the house of bread. It's kind of interesting that Jesus declared some 32 late years later, I am the bread of life. Anyone who comes to me will never hunger. So he was born in Bethlehem, the place of bread. And, uh, you know, when they walked up there, this is really important to know this. We're talking about uh, probably walking up through hills and mountains. And by the way, uh, Bethlehem, or, yeah, Bethlehem is at one of the highest points in Israel. So they were walking uphill and they probably walked approximately 90 miles. And, you know, to bring it home to us, 90 miles, how far is 90 miles? It's about as far as La Crosse, Wisconsin, is from Dubuque. So they had to walk up there. Joseph and Mary walked up there, and they walked up there. And verse uh, 5 tells us, He went up there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. So here's Mary walking 90 miles uphill, uh, what, to, to go up there uh, to fulfill uh, what he, she was asked to do or to, commanded to do by the Roman government. And you know, here again is something I just really want us all to recognize and as we go through this message. Sometimes we think if we're doing God's will, everything is going to be easy. We're going to have a bed of roses. There won't be any hard problems. And then if something starts to happen or go wrong or we have to suffer a little bit or have some trials, we think, oh my, I must be out of the will of God. Well, that's not true. Sometimes, and Joseph and Mary, and we're going to see that as we continue through there, they were exactly in the center of God's will for all these things that were going to happen. And even though they're probably feeling like, wow, we're just like a little small cog in the wheel, if you've ever felt that way, like life is kind of pushing me around and knocking me around and all of that. But all of these things God was allowing and all of them served a purpose. And so I'd want to encourage you today, if you're kind of feeling that way, just remember God loves you. And if you're trying to live for him, God's directing your steps. That that doesn't mean everything's going to be a bed roses. Well, he had to go up to Bethlehem because in Micah 5.2, uh, another prophet called Micah 
500 years earlier said that, that, G, that the uh, Messiah had to be born in Bethlehem. It says, but you, Bethlehem, though you are small among all the clans of Judah, out of you will come the one who will rule over Israel, whose origins are from, a, from old, from ancient times. Well, God is directing Mary and Joseph, actually even through this pagan king's, pagan king's hands, and moving them around to get them where they were supposed to go. You know, Mary and Joseph, after they had a 90-mile tri trip uphill, walking, by the way, uh, it says once they got there, verse 6, not on the screen, but it says while they were there, it, the time came for the baby to be born. Just that one little sort, short sentence, then the Bible is describing the most important life-changing event in the history of the world. It just said it was time for the baby to be born. Well, you know, Mary and Joseph would have been me. Well, I'd have been kind of wallowing in pity at this point and saying, gee, we just walked 90 miles and everything. Now we're going to have a baby and we're going to see it even is going to get worse and, you know, a little self-pity saying, hey, God, give me a break here. <laughs> Help me out here, Lord. I'm trying to do your work. Uh, so that's just, that's just me. I don't know if anybody else can relate to that. But while they're there, the baby is born. And uh, I love this picture here because um, I'm a grandpa and I love little babies. And uh, it says in verse 7, and, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, and she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Well, here's Mary and Joseph with their very first baby. And if you've, you've had your first baby, you know you always want everything to be just perfect for them. But as, we're, as he was looking at that, too, one of the things I think that it really brings out, and why I love that picture, of course, it's a, a, a portrayal by an artist or, or just a picture. But, uh, you know, the humanity of Jesus. Here is the Son of God. He leaves heaven. He comes, and because he's God, he can do anything he wants. He comes in the form of the helpless little baby. And there's Joseph and Mary. They're enjoying their first baby. And he is, uh, you know, there's a song, Mary, Do You Know? Talks about when you kiss the face of, of your child, you're kissing the face of God. And all that is so true. And I think it's all in that picture there, the humanity of Jesus. But remember, as it went on, it wrapped him in cloths, which literally means little pieces of, 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 almost like little rags or little pieces of extra cloth. And they wrapped him in that. And they placed him in a manger, in a feed trough. Here in Iowa, we know about feed troughs and mangers. They're, most, they're not the most hygienic place to put a little baby. I'm sure they tried to protect him as much as they could. But the very last part of that verse there, too, says, because there was no room for them in the inn. And every year, this always challenges me, and I want to challenge you with this. You know, most people in the world uh, don't really hate God or don't uh, refuse to accept Jesus or anything like that. But most people are just too busy that, to make time for Jesus. And if those people in those days would have knew that he was the Messiah born there, uh, they would have probably made time to, to help them out, help Mary and Joseph out and all that. But everybody was all so busy going up to Bethlehem and to pay their taxes and let's get out of here as soon as we can get this done and all those things going on. So they just totally had no time for Jesus. And what I want to challenge you and me, myself, am I, do I make time for Jesus in my life. It's really important that we do that because as busy as our lives are, if we don't make time for Jesus, uh, we're going to probably miss time with Jesus. Well, here's Joseph and Mary. They're right in the very center of God's will. But again, it would have been real easy for them to say, wow, we're out here in, in this cave. It was probably a cave or a stable. And we're out here. And, and gee, did we miss God someplace or something like that? And I think for many of us sometimes too, even when we're trying to do God's work, when things start going wrong, our first thought is, Am I, did I miss God somewhere along the line? 
Well, anyway, we're going to see that Jesus had to be born in a stable uh, because uh, Matthew 20, 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, he didn't come to be, sit on a throne and be a king, not in, in a physical sense, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And that's what Jesus came to do. And he started right out in the beginning, humbling himself and sacrificing his own own ease and his own comfort. Well, we got Mary, we got Joseph, we got uh, the Jesus, and now we're going to look at some angels and some shepherds, of course, which is always involved in the Christmas story. And it says, And there were shepherds lying out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. Well, shepherds, we're going to see a little more as we talk. Shepherds were on the low rung of the economic scale. And then it says this, An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Well, shepherds were not easily terrified, I can tell you that. They lived out in the, uh, among the bears and the lions and all that, and they, they, they had lived in a very... Tough, a tough life out there. And, but just think about this. One moment, the only light they have is starlight. They don't have street lights or anything out there. It's almost total darkness. And then all of a sudden, they immediately, there's this brilliant light. And by the way, if you, if you think about this, and this is a trick question I always ask at churches, how many angels uh, uh, appeared, uh, with, with, uh, how many angels appeared there when they announced to the shepherds? Well, in the beginning, there was only one. And uh, so there was only one angel. But that's all it takes to light up the whole sky would be just one angel. And it said they were terrified. And I'll tell you what, you'd be terrified too if you'd have been out in that field. So as we look at the shepherds a little more, you know, we need to look at the fact that shepherds uh, probably didn't dress very well. They weren't very well educated. They probably smelled like sheep. And, uh, you know, many of the religious elite would shun the shepherds. Even though when you think about it, shepherding was highly prized early on in Jewish history. You know, Abraham, <clears throat> excuse me, Isaac, Jacob, they were all, and David, they were all shepherds. <clears throat> but now as the, the, the culture is getting a little more, you know, everybody's in Jerusalem in their big temple and everything, and they began to look down on the Jewish, on the shepherds, even though just like in America today, sometimes we forget about farmers and agriculture in America, and we're talking about semiconductors or jet planes or everything like that. But you know what? If we quit producing all the food or we weren't able to, we'd see very quickly how important farming is to our country. So that's just a little extra on the side there. But they were looked down on, and you know, we could ask the question, why did God choose to announce the good news of his son to them uh, rather than the priest in Jerusalem, who are only about five miles away? And James 2.5 in the New Testament, I think, really answers that question. It says, listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith? and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him. They might have looked poor in the eyes of the world, but God, and by the way, if, you, if you're poor in the eyes of the world, just recognize the fact that God, you're still rich if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see a little later that God's wisdom really proves itself out a little later in the message. We go on, but it says, But the angel said to them, still remember, it's just one angel, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Don't be afraid. You know, that's the most repeated phrase in the, in the Word of God. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Good news is where we get the word gospel. It's uh, that God so loved us that he left heaven and came to this world. Good news. And you know what? When you know the good news of the fact that God loved you so much, 
that he wants you to spend eternity in heaven with him more than you even want to spend with him, then when you start understanding that, that will put great joy in your heart. And when you lay your head on your pillow at night, you'll know that if something happens during the night, I'm going to wake up in the presence of the Lord and that will give you great joy. And you know the world cannot even, will not even fool around and promise to give you joy. They'll give you something, a cheap imitation called fun. That's all this world can give you. If you want true joy, it's gotta, you've got to go to the, Lord, to the Lord for it. And then the last part of that sentence says, For all people. Jesus was a gift that was given to all people. Everybody that will humble themselves can receive this great joy of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether you're rich, poor, whatever your circumstances are, whether you're a sinner or a good person or whatever you are, uh, it, that, 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 that uh, price has been paid for you, and you, all you have to do is receive it. That's why John 1.12 says, Yet to all who receive them, to him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Well, the last part of verse 11 there says, good, it's kind of, where's that good, all this good news and good joy? Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Uh, in the town of David, uh, right there in Bethlehem, the Savior, the promised Messiah, has been born to you, born for your benefit, and he is Christ the Lord. Well, we've been talking about the Christ. It means the anointed one, the Messiah, the chosen one. But they said not only that, but he's going to be Christ the Lord, which in the, uh, in the Greek is Kyrios, which is the name for Almighty God. He is Christ the Lord. He's not only just a great Messiah. He's not just a great Savior. He is God in flesh. That's why we, call, we talk about Emmanuel, God in flesh right here with us. And then it goes on to say, This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Well, we just talked about that a little bit before. The baby Jesus, he's wrapped in the cloths. He's lying in this humble little manger. And verse 13, I love this. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, by the way, I love that word suddenly because that's something... Uh, in our lives, you know, things might not be going so well, but God will appear and suddenly everything can change. But now it says a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying. So now it's just not one angel, but now the whole sky is full of it. And by the way, uh, if you looked at the word where, where, where they translated a great company or a multitude, it literally means an uncountable number. It means, it easily could have meant tens of thousands of angels just filling the sky. And by the way, they weren't singing. We always think they were singing, but they were saying, praising to God. And you know what? That's what angels do in heaven. That's what we're going to do when we get to heaven. We're going to praise God that he loved us so much that he left heaven and came down here for us. And again, now here's what they're, what they're saying. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. Glory to God. What's that saying there? All the honor goes to God. Not some of it, not most of it. All glory to God who is the highest. He's the creator of all things. And anyone who then bows their knees and accepts God and, and what he has done for us, then they will have peace and his favor, his grace will be poured on them. So praise God. And then it says, when the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let a, let's go to Bethlehem and see that thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Well, here's why another reason why God chose these lowly shepherds. When they heard the good news, they were willing to do something about it. Do you know many people in our country know a lot about Jesus? 
that, or they know there was a person named Jesus, but they're not willing to get up on Sunday morning and go to church. Uh, they're not willing to, to give to God's work or do anything like that. These, these uh, shepherds, now that they heard the good news, they were willing to sacrifice, to make some changes, to do some things different. Uh, they're going to see this thing which the angels had told them about. By the way, I said the angels told them about, but if you notice the last verse there, it says, which the Lord had told them about. God was using the angels as messenger, but it was God who was speaking to them. Whenever you hear a message from an angel, it's not their message, it's a message from God. So then it tells us in verse 16, out on the screen there, it says, so they hurried off. Well, here we go again. Here they are. They're out there watching sheep. There's lions. There's bears out there. I don't know, did they have a couple guys stay behind and watch the rest of the sheep or what? But it's late at night. They don't have street lights. They don't have flashlights. They're out there walking around in the dark. And by the way, they didn't know exactly where Mary and Joseph were. They probably had to search all around trying to find uh, until they found Mary and Joseph. Now, maybe the Spirit of God led them somehow. But anyway, they, you know, they could have said, well, we have no idea where this baby is. But no, they went and they searched till they found the baby. And, uh, you know, it's really important that if you really know who Jesus is and what he's done for you, it will make you do things different. If you can say all your life has been pretty much the same, whether you knew Jesus or not, there's something very wrong because Jesus will make a change in your life. So here we come to our last slide here. And uh, verse 17, not out there, but I'm reading it from Luke as we continue. When they had seen him, Jesus, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. They couldn't help but to talk about this wonderful thing. And if you really understand what God has done for you, your main focus, your main desire will be to tell people about Jesus too. You know, people say, uh, how did, you know, they see this little baby. How can they be so excited? Well, you know what? The angels told him that this is a Messiah. This is the Savior. And there used to be a saying, and it's a good one. It says, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. That's where the shepherds were. This looked like a little baby in a little manger, but God had told him, this is the Messiah. This is the one who's going to deliver people from their sins and they believed it and they acted on it and it says later the shepherds returned glorifying praising God for all the things which just which had just been told well as we're finishing up here today let's stop for a moment and think about how what happened where's all these people other people now as they're out telling other people and no, there's no, uh, uh, nothing that tells us that any, of, any people ever went to find Jesus, even though Jerusalem was only five miles away. Well, here we are so, so many, many years later, and because of the, the message, message of those uh, shepherds, uh, until today, we still know the great story of Mary and Joseph and, and Jesus and uh, Jesus Christ is still saving people today. I pray today that you'd put your trust in him. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.